4.2. For most people, art for the last few centuries has meant paintings and sculptures, and suddenly, there are all these new kinds of sculptures and installations that, for most people, don't seem like art. First of all, could you please explain exactly what these kinds of sculptures and installations are? Um, well, installations are really mixed media works that take up a whole gallery or space, while the modern sculptures you're referring to、mm -hmm. are assemblies of objects that may take up a little less space, but that you probably wouldn't think of as traditional works of art when you first see them.、Hmm. So, how would you explain to people that installations are also art? Um, well. An installation, or this new kind of modern sculpture, is really no different from a painting or a traditional sculpture if you think about where the artist starts from. That is, they have an idea about something they want to communicate, and then they decide how to communicate that idea. So that could be in paint, or it could be in stone, or it could be in wood or metal, or it could be through an installation. Which could be a kind of assembly of different types of objects. In all three methods, in all these different media, they would still be trying to say the same thing.、Mm -hmm. They would then choose the medium that was suitable for them, or which they'd been trained in, or、mm -hmm. which was suitable for that particular idea they wanted to communicate. A lot of artists have been trained in how to make an installation, perhaps more than they have been trained in drawing today.、Hmm. But I think a lot of people would think that while drawing and painting require a level of expertise that the average person doesn't have. Yeah. When people look at some installations, they think, "Well, I could do that." They don't see that there's any expertise involved at all. <laughs> well, it's just different skills. For example, take Damien Hirst and Away from the Flock,、okay. which is a sheep in some formaldehyde in a case. First of all, he had to have the idea, and this was a very original idea. No one had ever done anything like that before. <laughs> he came up with the idea of an animal, a sheep isolated from its flock. And he came up with the idea of preserving this animal in formaldehyde,、hmm. which is something that scientists have certainly done before, but artists hadn't. And then he had to research how the animal could be properly preserved in this substance, the formaldehyde, and how in ten or twenty years it would still be there、hmm. and in good condition for people to look at.、Um, so there is a technical side to it as well. And then, of course, he had to arrange it in a particular way, put the animal in a particular pose, so that it looks as if it's alive. Although, of course, we all know that it isn't. And so, it's a combination of an original idea and some very、hmm. specific skills. And what is he trying to communicate to us through it? Um. Well, as I said, the sheep looks alive, even though we all know it isn't.、Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a kind of statement about death and life, just、mm. as lots of classical works of art, paintings are about life and death, and it's not so different from those. It's just that it's expressed in a different way.、Um, I think the important thing is what it gets the viewers to think about and to reflect、mm. on, and that's the same with all art. I mean, there isn't really any difference. Okay, so I can understand that you need a certain amount of technical ability to create the sheep in formaldehyde, but what about the bed? I mean, the bed is something that you look at and you think, "Yeah, that looks like my bed in the morning." <laughs> well, Tracy Emmons' bed isn't actually her bed as it is in the morning when she gets up every day. <laughs> It is a bed. And there are sheets and pillows and lots of other objects, but she has assembled these objects to represent herself.、Hmm. This is an autobiographical piece, just like a self-portrait, without her face or her body in it, but it still represents her.、Hmm. It's the story of her life. It's her relationship with all the men in her life and other people.、Mm -hmm. You look on the floor, and there are lots of pieces of her. There are her slippers, her toy dog, and newspapers that she's read, and bottles of water. So it's a story of her life,、oh. and it's arranged in a very particular way. It's not random, not just like your bed or my bed.、Mm -hmm. It's a bed that she's very specifically organized to communicate something about herself. 
Um, I mean, it's a different set of skills from painting a self-portrait. Mm-hmm. But maybe it actually communicates a whole lot more to us, to viewers, than some self-portraits do. Because we can actually look at it and understand, as contemporary viewers, a lot about her life. Hmm. And incidentally, Tracy Emin is, in fact, extremely skilled at drawing. So if she'd wanted to draw a self-portrait, for example, she could have done that. But she chose this way of communicating her message. 4.3 1. When people look at some installations, they think, well, I could do that. They don't see that there's any expertise involved at all. 2. And then, of course, he had to arrange it in a particular way, put the animal in a particular pose, so that it looks as if it's alive. Although, of course, we all know that it isn't. 3. I mean, the bed is something that you look at and you think, yeah, that looks like my bed in the morning. 4.4 One of a series My word, I said. That really is a remarkable likeness of a cold fried egg on a chipped plate. How much is it? Actually, they said... It is a cold fried egg on a chipped plate. It is one of a series created by Laura Carumbo, a hundred and fifty thousand pounds. And I said, Whoo! And they said, This is not just any cold fried egg on any chipped plate. It is this cold fried egg on this chipped plate. Carambo's work celebrates the thisness of things. She shows us how this and the other move in a perpetual dance, mediating between and uniting the amphimetropic opposites of our Janus faced universe. Well, I could see that it all made sense. And between you and me, I've looked at the reviews and the auction catalogs, and I reckon I got a real bargain. Come and look! 4.5 1. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston. 2. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston. 3. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston. Four. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston. Five. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston. 4.6 1. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston, not in San Francisco. 2. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston, not rent one. 3. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston, but my wife didn't. 4. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston, but my wife wanted a house. 5. I wanted to buy a condo in Boston, but we couldn't afford one. Four point seven. Season of Calm Weather by Ray. Detrained at Biarritz one summer noon and in an hour had run through their hotel, onto the beach, into the ocean, and back out, to bake upon the sand. To see George Smith sprawled, burning there. You'd think him only a tourist flown to Europe and soon to be transported home. But here was a man who loved art more than life itself. George, his wife loomed over him, 
I know what you've been thinking. I can read your lips. He lay perfectly still, waiting. And? Picasso, she said. He winced. Some day she would learn to pronounce that name. Please, she said, relax. I know you heard the rumor this morning, but you should see your eyes. Your tick is back. All right, Picasso's here, down the coast a few miles away, visiting friends in some small fishing town. But you must forget it or our vacation's ruined. I wish I'd never heard the rumor, he said honestly. If only, she said, you liked other painters. Others. Yes, there were others. He could breakfast most congenially on Caravaggio still lifes of autumn pears and midnight plums. For lunch, those fire-squirting, thick-wormed Van Gogh sunflowers. But the great feast, the paintings he saved his palette for, who else but the creator of Girl Before a Mirror and Guernica? Four point eight. I keep thinking, he said aloud, if we saved our money, we'll never have five thousand dollars. I know, he said quietly, but it's nice thinking we might bring it off some day. Wouldn't it be great to just step up to him and say, Pablo, here's five thousand. Give us the sea, the sand, that sky, or any old thing you want. We'll be happy. After a moment, his wife touched his arm. I think you'd better go in the water now, she said. Yes, he said. I'd better do just that. During the afternoon, George Smith came out and went into the ocean with the vast spilling motions of now warm, now cool people who at last, with the sun's decline, their bodies all lobster colors, trudged for their wedding cake hotels. The beach lay deserted for endless mile on mile save for two people. One was George Smith, towel over shoulder. Far along the shore, another shorter, square-cut man walked alone in the tranquil weather. He was deeper tanned, his close-shaven head dyed almost mahogany by the sun, and his eyes were clear and bright as water in his face. So the shoreline stage was set, and in a few minutes, the two men would meet. 4.9 The stranger stood alone, glancing about, he saw his aloneness, saw the waters of the lovely bay, saw the sun sliding down the late colors of the day, and then, half turning, spied a small wooden object on the sand. It was no more than the slender stick from a lime ice cream delicacy long since melted away. Smiling, he picked the stick up. With another glance around to reinsure his solitude, the man stooped again, and holding the stick, gently with light sweeps of his hand, began to do the one thing in all the world he knew best how to do. He began to draw incredible figures along the sand. He sketched one figure, and then moved over, and still looking down, completely focused on his work now, drew a second and a third figure, and after that a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. George Smith printing the shoreline with his feet, gazed here, gazed there, and then saw the man ahead. George Smith, drawing nearer, saw that the man, deeply tanned, was bending down. Nearer yet, and it was obvious what the man was up to. George Smith chuckled. Of course, of course. Along on the beach, this man, how old, sixty-five, seventy, was scribbling and doodling away. How the sand flew, 
how the wild portraits flung themselves out there on the shore, how... George Smith took one more step and stopped, very still. The stranger was drawing and drawing, and did not seem to sense that anyone stood immediately behind him and the world of his drawings in the sand. Four point ten. George Smith looked down at the sand, and after a long while looking, he began to tremble. For there on the flat shore were pictures of Grecian lions and Mediterranean goats and maidens and children dancing, and the sand in the dying light was the color of copper on which was now slashed a message that any man in any time might read and savor down the years. The artist stopped. George Smith drew back and stood away. The artist glanced up, surprised to find someone so near. Then he simply stood there, looking from George Smith to his own creations flung like idle footprints down the way. He smiled at last and shrugged as if to say, Look what I've done. See what a child. You will forgive me, won't you? One day or another, we are all fools. You too, perhaps. So allow an old fool this, eh? Good. Good. But George Smith could only look at the little man with the sun-dark skin and the clear, sharp eyes and say the man's name once in a whisper to himself. They stood thus for perhaps another five seconds. George Smith staring at the sand freeze and the artist watching George Smith with amused curiosity. George Smith opened his mouth, closed it, put out his hand, took it back. He stepped towards the picture, stepped away. Then he moved along the line of figures, like a man viewing a precious series of marbles cast up from some ancient ruin on the shore. His eyes did not blink. His hand wanted to touch, but did not dare to touch. He wanted to run, but did not run. 4.11 He looked suddenly at the hotel. Run, yes, run. What? Grab a shovel? Dig? Excavate? Save a chunk of this all too crumbling sand? Find a repairman. Race him back here with plaster of Paris to cast a mold of some small, fragile part of these. No, no. Silly. Silly. Or... His eyes flicked to his hotel window. The camera. Run, get it, get back, and hurry along the shore, clicking, changing film, clicking until... George Smith whirled to face the sun. It burned faintly on his face. His eyes were two small fires from it. The sun was half underwater, and as he watched, it sank the rest of the way in a matter of seconds. The artist had drawn nearer and now was gazing into George Smith's face with great friendliness, as if he were guessing every thought. Now he was nodding his head in a little bow. Now the ice cream stick had fallen casually from his fingers. Now he was saying good night, good night. Now he was gone, walking back down the beach towards the south. George Smith stood looking after him. After a full minute, he did the only thing he could possibly do. He started at the beginning of the fantastic freeze, and he walked slowly along the shore. And when he came to the end of the animals and men, he turned round and started back in the other direction, just staring down as if he had lost something and did not quite know where to find it. He kept on doing this, until there was no more light in the sky or on the sand to see by. 
He sat down at the supper table. You're late, said his wife. I just had to come down alone. I'm ravenous. That's all right, he said. Anything interesting happen on your walk? She asked. No, he said. You look funny. Uh, George, you didn't swim out too far, did you, and almost drown? I can tell by your face you did swim out too far, didn't you? Yes, he said. Well, she said, watching him closely, don't ever do that again. Now, what'll you have? He picked up the menu and started to read it, and stopped suddenly. What's wrong? asked his wife. He turned his head and shut his eyes for a moment. Listen. She listened. I don't hear anything, she said. Don't you? No. What is it? Just the tide, he said after a while, sitting there, his eyes still shut. Just the tide coming in. Four point fourteen. Part one. What is it about New York that inspires you? I was born here and raised nearby, and so I have memories of New York City from my early childhood. And to me, it was always a magical place. Um, anything is possible here, and everything seems to happen here. And um, as my aunt once said to me, she said, people who live in New York, even if they've only been here for one year, they feel like they own the place. And I think that it's because New York is almost more of an event than a place where everything's changing and becoming something new all the time. And I think that's why it, it draws creative people. And it's just very inspiring. Do you always paint in situ or do you sometimes use photos? I always paint in situ, almost always. I use uh, sketches and um, I work a little from memory and from sketches. Um, I touch things up a little in the studio sometimes or finish things. Um, but I like to be in the location because it's always changing and I take pieces of um, the scene, that hap things that happen at different times, a bird flying by might be very beautiful or a um, person walking in the street and assuming a certain gesture or a pose that's perfect for the composition. Things like that happen over the course of a painting and they can be just perfect. But a photo is, um, is very st uh, static and uh, kind of flat and it doesn't interest me to work from that. Does that mean you have to work very fast? Actually, I do. I have learned to work very fast because um, there's so many things that change on the street, yeah, including being blocked by trucks. <laughs> and um, uh, I do often work very fast. The, the seasons are constantly changing. People think of the four seasons, but really nature changes almost every day or every day. And um, so if I start a painting at one point, it's hard to finish it later in a different season or later on in the same season. What techniques do you use? Um, I use... The traditional technique, I use oil paint and um, brushes and canvas. How long does it normally take you to finish a painting from start to finish? Oh, every painting is different. They can take a few hours or a few years. I've worked on some paintings for years and years. And um, sometimes I'll go come back to a painting the following year when the season and the um, different light is, is right for that painting. As well as the city pictures, you also paint outside New York in the countryside. What similarities and differences are there in painting the city and painting the countryside? Um, the city is very geometric, and I love, I happen to love geometry. I love angles, crisscrossing, and the composition, and different shape, geometric shapes. But the, um, the countryside, when I first started painting, it was very difficult for me for that reason, because 
you don't have the perspective of the streets and the angles of the roofs and so on to lead your eye through the painting. Um, it's, it's, uh, it was a wonderful um, experience to learn how to make your eye move across a grassy field as opposed to down a street where it's so clear and easy kind of to figure out. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of painting in the country and the city? Uh, the countryside is, is a wonderful place for me to paint. I love it because I'm usually alone, pretty much alone there, and I'm not distracted by passers-by. In New York City, um, there are just so many distractions of people coming up to me, and they're usually well-meaning, but it's, it's just an in, interruption. It's a distraction from my work. And the countryside is so beautiful that I love painting there. But. Do you ever paint portraits? I do occasionally. I love painting portraits, but it's very rare to find someone who will sit for a few hours um, for a couple of sessions, and I don't like to do portraits from photos. I've tried it, and I don't like the results. 4.15 Part 2 What kinds of things have influenced you as an artist? Um, I think one of the greatest influences on me um, was growing up on the banks of the Hudson, which is such a beautiful place in the different light and different times of year. I think that was a main influence on me to want to be a landscape painter. Um, also, there were lots of paintings in the house where I grew up, and my parents loved painting very much, and also my mother painted some. So I, um, especially after we all grew up, she painted. So I, there were a lot of influences on me. What's your favorite time of day for painting? Actually, my favorite time of day is sunrise, but I don't always get up in time for that, so I um, early morning and also late afternoon. Do you have a favorite time of year or season? Uh, yes, I do, actually. I love to paint in the, just before the spring when the air is so crisp and clear and there aren't yet any leaves on the trees so they can really see down the streets. There's something magical in New York about that time of year around March. And then, of course, when spring comes and the blossoms and the trees start to come out, it's just magical, but it lasts a very short time. Are there any other cities that you'd like to go and paint in? Oh, there are thousands of cities I'd love to go to paint in. I, um, the ancient cities, the older cities, um, uh, Paris, Amsterdam, um, Florence, Venice, uh, many places in Sicily, in Greece. I'd love to go to Turkey and paint on the Mediterranean and um, any place where there's antiquity and where the, um, there's water or mountains. But it is hard to travel and paint. Um, it's much better to go to one place and settle in and paint um, for a while in one place to get to really know the landscape. That's what I prefer to do. What do you think are the pros and cons of an artist's life? Uh, I think to be an artist, usually, it requires a lot of sacrifice. And I know that sounds like a cliche, but it's true because it requires an enormous amount of time. It requires being free to suddenly change your plans at the, at the moment's notice. Um, for example, being a landscape painter is completely insane. It's um, I could be going out the door with one painting under my arm to work on it, and the weather could change, and I'd be working on a different painting, or I could have plans with someone and suddenly change them or drop the plans because the weather's right for a particular painting. Um, that's a real big uh, sacrifice in terms of your social life and also, of course, finances. Um, if, as I do, I, put, I tend to put painting before anything else. Well, it's hard to earn money and, and be a dedicated artist at the same time, I think. They, they um, contradict one another to some degree. 4.16 1. I was born here and raised nearby, and so I have memories of New York City from my early childhood, and to me it was always a magical place. 2. Things like that happen over the course of a painting, and they can be just perfect. Three. So if I start a painting at one point, it's hard to finish it later in a different season or later on in the same season. Four. I've worked on some paintings for years and years, 
And um, sometimes I'll go come back to a painting the following year when the season and the um, different light is, is right for that painting. Five. I love painting portraits, but it's very rare to find someone who will sit for a few hours um, for a couple of sessions, and I don't like to do portraits from photos. Six. And also my mother painted some, so I, um, especially after we all grew up, she painted. So I, I, there were a lot of influences on me. Seven. It requires an enormous amount of time. It requires being free to suddenly change your plans at the, at the moment's notice. 4.17. Do you often go to art galleries? I don't often go to art galleries. I'm more of a museum kind of guy. So a museum of natural history, a museum of modern art sometimes, but more, more of a museum guy. What kind of art do you like? Uh, any, so I just got back from a trip to Amsterdam, so I was able to see the, a lot of different uh, museums there, including the Van Gogh Museum, so that was really cool, because um, it actually takes you through like a path of his life and all the paintings that he painted throughout the different ages of his life, so that was really neat to see uh, an entire artist's work throughout their entire lifetime period, so. Why do you like Van Gogh? I like Van Gogh because he he has a pretty uh, diverse painting background. Um, you can definitely see the different styles of painting throughout his entire lifetime, from when he was a young kid to when he was a little bit more traumatized to when he painted his famous self-portrait uh, later in his life. Do you have a favorite painting or poster in your house? Unfortunately, I don't have any paintings in my house. I'm only 26, so I'm not that cultured yet. but. Uh, I do have different types of antiques. I'm probably the youngest viewer in Antiques Roadshow, so I have a couple jade plates hanging on my walls and a couple older antiques from back home, so. Do you often go to art galleries? I do like going to art galleries. I majored in fine arts in college, so I did a lot of frequenting of the Chelsea galleries over there. What kind of art do you like? Um, I'd say in general, in regards to a medium of art, I really love photography and printmaking. Uh, I focused on printmaking in college again, so lots of silk screening and etching and collage work. Do you have a favorite artist? Yeah, absolutely. I think my favorite artist right now, uh, that's currently working anyway, is a photographer, and her name is Cass Bird. Uh, she does a lot of fashion photography, but she's also really fantastic at capturing very special moments of her children, which are reminiscent of another artist I like called Sally Mann. Do you have a favorite painting or poster in your house? So my favorite piece of artwork that's hanging in my house right now is a photograph by Casper, and it's two young ladies uh, standing on a highway overpass waving to all the cars that are going underneath them. Do you often go to art galleries? I don't really go to art galleries that often, but I like to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. What kind of art do you like? I am a fan of Impressionist paintings and also Greco-Roman sculpture. Do you have a favorite painting or poster in your house? My favorite work of art in my house is a photograph my friend took while she was in Paris of the Louvre Art Museum. Can you describe it? It's the sun setting over the museum. You can see the light filtering through the triangle, and it creates a beautiful setting and feeling. Do you often go to art galleries? I don't go as often as I should, actually. Um, a lot of my friends go quite a bit, and I never seem to find the time. It might be because I'm outside London. Um, I think if you live in London, you spend more time, or it's more available to you to go to them. So I, I don't go as much as I should. What kind of art do you like? I like, ex I like art that feels very accessible, that you can understand, so portraiture um, and photography as well, travel photography, I find really interesting. Do you have a favorite painting or poster in your house? Uh, I do actually, um, and it's, a, it's in my parents' house. It's a painting that my, my best friend did for our family because she's a, an artist by profession and she 
painted a picture of my mum and I, um, a photo that we took when I was very young, um, and painted it as if from the point of view of the person taking the, the picture. Um, and it's a really interesting picture, and she set it on the, on the um, cliffs in Cornwall, which is where our family used to spend a lot of time. Um, and it's a really lovely picture that she painted for us as a gift. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> 4.18 1 It actually takes you through like a path of his life and all the paintings. 2 I majored in fine arts in college, so I did a lot of frequenting of the Chelsea galleries. 3 um, I'd say in general, in regards to a medium of art, I really love photography and printmaking. 4 you can see the light filtering through the triangle, and it creates a beautiful setting. Five. It's a painting that my, my best friend did for our family, because she's a, an artist by profession. Four point nineteen. We have in the studio Dr. Linda Blakey, who is helping us separate the medical facts from all the myths and old wives' tales that are out there. So my first question, Linda, mm -hmm. is there any truth in the belief that if you eat a large meal in the evening, you are more likely to gain weight than if you eat the same amount of food earlier in the day? Well, there is a clear answer to that. If you're watching your weight, what matters is what you eat, not when you eat it. Huh. A calorie at midday is no different from a calorie at midnight. And the idea that your metabolism slows down in the evening is actually a myth. Hmm. As a matter of fact, there is a medical condition called night eating syndrome, which affects 2% of the population. And people who suffer from it eat very little during the day, but often wake up and eat during the night. Mm -hmm. These people, on average, are no more overweight than people who do not suffer from this syndrome. So I can go out for a big meal in the evening and not feel guilty about it? <laughs> Absolutely. As long as you don't have a big lunch, too. Well, that's good. The next question I'd like to ask you about is catching colds. It's always seemed obvious to me that if you stay out in the cold and wind, you are more likely to catch a cold. Hmm. But I also remember reading somewhere that this was a myth. What's the truth about that one? Well, colds, we know, are caused by viruses, right. which you catch from uh, an infected person, for example, when they cough or sneeze. Uh -huh. Now, for many years, doctors believed that the only reason why it was more common to catch a cold in the winter was because people stayed indoors more, and so they infected one another. Right. But recent research has found that being exposed to cold temperatures does, in fact, lower our body's defenses. Huh. So that means that if you get cold, you're more likely to become infected by a cold virus or to develop a cold if you've already been infected. It's not a myth. It's true. Huh. Okay. That all makes sense to me. Now, something my parents used to tell me was that it's dangerous to take a bath or a shower during a thunderstorm because I might get electrocuted. I've always thought it was crazy. Is it an old wives' tale? <laughs> In fact, that's actually true. Huh. Between 10 and 20 people a year get an electric shock while taking a bath or shower during a thunderstorm, and some of them die as a result. Wow. It's due to the fact that metal pipes are excellent conductors of electricity, as is tap water. So... Even though statistically it's not very likely to happen to you, especially if you live in a grounded building, uh -huh. you should probably avoid showering during a storm. Okay, I'll remember that. Now, the next one is something I'm always saying to my children. Turn the light on. You can't possibly read in that dim light. And they always tell me they can read perfectly well. But reading in dim light must be bad for their eyes, right? Well... 
That's one that parents around the world have been telling their children for generations, but it actually has no real scientific basis. Huh. Reading in the dark or in dim light can cause a temporary strain on the eyes, but it quickly goes away once you return to bright light. Well, now I know. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one affects me directly. Every summer in the mosquito season, I get really badly bitten, even when I put insect repellent on. But my wife never gets bitten at all. She says that mosquitoes don't like her. Is that possible? It's irritating, isn't it? Yes. As a matter of fact, it seems to be true. Female mosquitoes, which are the ones that bite, are attracted to the carbon dioxide we exhale, our body heat, and certain chemicals in our sweat. Uh huh. But some lucky people produce chemicals that either prevent mosquitoes from detecting them, or that actually drive them away. Huh. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those lucky people either. But your wife obviously is. The last thing I would like you to clarify for us is the idea that bottled water is purer than tap water. Now I know it's one thing to drink bottled water if you're traveling in a country where the water hasn't been treated or isn't safe to drink. But what about here in the United States? We're all a bit suspicious of what comes out of our taps, and that's why sales of bottled water have risen so much over the last decade. But what many people don't realize is that bottled water isn't subjected to the same regular testing that tap water is. Huh. And in some tests, a third of the samples of bottled water analyzed were contaminated. In any case, a quarter of all bottled water sold is just filtered tap water. Four point twenty. One. If you're watching your weight, what matters is what you eat, not when you eat it. Two, colds we know are caused by viruses, which you catch from an infected person. Three, but recent research has found that being exposed to cold temperatures does, in fact, lower our body's defenses. Four, as a matter of fact, there is a medical condition called night eating syndrome, which affects two percent of the population. Five, reading in the dark or in dim light can cause a temporary strain on the eyes, but it quickly goes away once you return to bright light. Six, our body heat and certain chemicals in our sweat. Four point twenty one. Agree. Avoid. Can't afford. Can't help. Can't stand. Deny. Had better. Happen. Imagine. Involve. It's not worth. Let. Look forward to. Manage. Miss. Practice. Pretend. Refuse. Regret. Risk. Suggest. Tend. Threaten. Would rather. Four point twenty two. One. It's a kind of treatment that uses hypnosis, that is, putting people into an unconscious state to help with physical or emotional problems. Two. It's medicine or remedies made from herbs and plants. Three. It's a system of treating diseases or conditions using very small amounts of the substance that causes the disease or condition. Four. It's a technique that uses natural sweet-smelling oils for controlling pain or for rubbing into the body during massage. Five. It's a type of alternative treatment in which somebody's feet are massaged in a particular way in order to heal other parts of the body or to make them feel mentally relaxed. Six. 
It involves treating some diseases and physical problems by pressing and moving the bones in a person's spine or joints. 7. It's the treatment of some diseases and physical problems by pressing and moving the bones and muscles. 8. It's a Chinese method of treating pain and disease which uses special thin needles that are pushed into the skin in particular parts of the body. 4.23 1. Hypnotherapy 2. Herbal medicine. 3. Homeopathy. 4. Aromatherapy. 5. Reflexology. 6. Chiropractic. 7. Osteopathy. 8. Acupuncture. 4.24. An acupuncturist. A chiropractor. A homeopath. Homeopathic medicine. Hypnosis. A hypnotherapist. An osteopath. A reflexologist. 4.25 Have you ever used alternative medicine? Yes. What did you use? Acupuncture. And did it work? Well, it actually did. I had a terrible time of... I lost my sense of taste and smell. Wow. Which started off with a cold, and then I completely lost my sense of taste and smell for about three or four months, and it was very debilitating, and it was really pretty frightening. I can imagine. You suddenly realize that there is no point in eating at all because you can't enjoy any of it, and all the beauty of life kind of goes. It's an incredible thing of not having one of your senses. And somebody recommended acupuncture to me, and I went along and I said, do you think you can do anything about it? And she said, yes, I think I can. She said, so here's a rose, which was in her room. Right. And she said, put your nose into it and tell me what you can smell. I put my nose into it, and I couldn't smell anything at all, absolutely nothing at all. And she laid me down, and half an hour of needles later... I got up, and she said, try smelling that rose again. And I put my nose into it, and there was this faint, faint smell of rose, which was the most beautiful thing I've ever smelled in my entire life. So that was it? You were cured? No. Well, over the course of the next two weeks, very, very slowly, it came back. I was walking down Cambria Avenue, and a woman walked past, and I went, oh, perfume, and I literally turned and followed her. If she'd seen me, she would have thought I was really weird because I practically had my nose in her hair. But anyway, it all came back. Wow. Ever since my children were born. Well, even before my children were born, which is a really long time ago now, we've used alternative medicine. Or as I like to call it, complementary medicine. We use homeopathy. And none of my children ever had an antibiotic while they were growing up. And I think that's something to be proud of. They have used them since they've been adults for various reasons, often because they have to work. But apart from that, no antibiotics. And I don't think I've had any in the last 30 years or so. Kate, have you ever used alternative medicine? Well, the time I remember was during the birth of my second child. My first was a pretty dramatic experience, so I thought I'd go and find out if I could make it easier. I went to a homeopath who gave me a lot of pills and said that when contractions started, I should take one and then, you know, an hour later take another one and an hour later take two. But within half an hour, I'd taken all three bottles and was still in agony. No. Yeah. They had no effect at all? No. So did you call the person? These aren't working? No, I never did, but I wouldn't recommend homeopathy for childbirth. I can understand why not. So, Adam, what's your take on alternative medicine? Do you have any experience? One, just one, 
and I was taking a very long flight from Miami to Vancouver, and I don't like flying, though I don't take anything for it. But when I got there, I was only there for just a few days, and I wanted to enjoy my waking hours, and the jet lag was crazy, so I bought some herbal sleeping pills. Oh, I see. So I didn't want to use really heavy, real sleeping pills. I've never used those. So I went to buy some herbal sleeping pills and put them in my bag. And then I got there and I looked at the package and it said, take eight, half an hour before bedtime. So I thought that was a lot, but that's what it said. So I took eight, but it was kind of like having a lot of grass in my mouth. It was like swallowing a lot of grass before bed and it didn't agree with me. So I was like burping up like a lot of grass and I was burping so I wasn't sleeping. So I wasn't really convinced about them. So a great night's sleep. It was wonderful. A lot of grass.